Hi everybody, this is lecture 8.1, Understanding Disabilities. So in this lecture we'll be talking about uh, defining uh, disabilities, talking about and defining issues that people with dis disabilities face. Then we'll talk about the history of disability in the United States. So when most people think about disability, we really think about it in terms of I know it when I see it, right? So um, when we encounter someone uh, that we perceive to have a disability, we know to treat them in a certain way, or we at least perceive that we should treat them in a certain way. However, it is important that uh, to be highly specific when talking about disability, because obviously uh, disability has a really wide scope of what is disabled and what is not disabled and what is mental disability, what is physical disability, what is social disability. Uh, additionally, in purely practical terms, our healthcare system is highly dependent on diagnosis. So some diagnoses qualify as disability, others don't qualify as disability, and those that do qualify as a disability uh, need to be properly uh, registered as such so that the person can be treated in a way that's meaningful. Additionally, um, it wouldn't make sense to treat um, other disabilities as a medical diagnosis. It doesn't make so much sense, uh, for example, to uh, treat uh, social anxiety disorder in most cases as if it were a physical uh, disability problem it is more of a mental disability pro problem. Additionally, government programs are also dependent on diagnosis, uh, again also very tied to healthcare systems. Thus, having the label of disabled entitles an individual to a variety of government assistance programs and legal protections, and we will talk about that in much greater detail uh, in, uh, later on in the lecture in this unit. According to the Americans with Disabilities Act, also known as the ADA, someone is disabled if they, quote, uh, have a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Uh, and that definition of major life activities has been extended uh, since the ADA uh, came into effect in the early 1990s. Uh, so physical examples of such a limit include blindness, deafness, the inability to use one's legs, uh, a missing limb, uh, other physical type problems like that. Mental disabilities, uh, examples of those include ADHD, uh, dyslexia, severe social anxiety disorder, uh, various learning disorders. A person uh, who has a history or record of such an impairment. So that's very important to keep in mind. If there's no record of the person having been disabled, then uh, the then uh, government officials, including teachers, cannot actually treat the person as if they have a disability. That's important to know. If ever uh, you are diagnosed with a disability, you need to inform those people so that they can uh, help you along with it. Uh, additionally, a person has a d is disabled if uh, they are perceived by others as having such an impairment. This is the social component of how we deal with disabilities in our society. There are some uh, conditions in which the person's functioning is not actually impacted, but the way per that people perceive them is what's impacted. Uh, for example, this condition known as Mosaic Down Syndrome. Uh, in Mosaic Down Syndrome, uh, the uh, individual appears as if they have Down Syndrome, but they actually um, do not have Down Syndrome. Well, they have the physical appearances of Down Syndrome, but their intellectual capacity is actually uh, full uh, or equal to one without uh, Down Syndrome. It's a rather intriguing disease, actually. It's important to note that 10% of the world's population uh, can be diagnosed with some sort of disability or another. Uh, not everyone who possesses diagnosis uh, 
that qualify actually identify as being disabled. So there are many people that actually um, in p the purely most strictest terms do qualify are disabled, you know, in the, the strictest terms, but they choose not to live their lives as if they were disabled, so thus they do not seek that diagnosis. So that may uh, change that actual 10% number to as little below or a little above. And additionally, um, because normal, in terms of dis disability, is a social construct, disability is a social construction at how uh, people who are disa being disabled is uh, dependent on people how people treat them. Just like race is a social construction, just like gender is a social construction, disability is also a social construction, and that social construction of disability uh, says how we typically treat people with disability. And with all of these things, even if we don't like how people with disability are typically treated, and if we think that's really terrible, it's important to know that what the custom is so that we can break it and so that we can challenge that custom. Now let's talk about a history of disability in the United States. Prior to the modern era, people with disabilities were almost entirely ignored by society. Um, and cons this is largely because concepts of individuality are relatively modern. Uh, it, prior to the modern era, um, you as a person, you as an individual human with individual human rights uh, did not matter. You were part of society and part of the tribe, part of the nation, uh, a vassal of the king, whatever. Thus, people with disabilities uh, because individuality was not something that was thought of, were thought of as being burdens on the unit, the greatest unit of community, right? Thus, uh, that kind of burden, uh, a person that could not pull their own weight, uh, were treated very, very badly by modern standards. Um, this is one of those moments in sociology when, yes, we acknowledge that societies had different standards of how to treat people, um, but we still do, we, we're still not purely, it's okay to judge past societies for treating people with disability very badly. Uh, we don't want to do that and we don't want to, I guess, be as fair as possible to them the way we would a uh, different society. But whatever, enough of that weird tangent. Okay. It's good to know where your words come from. Uh, handicapped actually uh, has kind of an ugly connotation. Uh, in England in the 1800s, disabled people would beg with their caps in their hand, uh, thus handicapped, um, because people refused uh, to employ them. They were absolutely unemployable because of ableism. Um, so that's where that term handicapped actually comes from. It was common in rural America to lock mentally and physically disabled people in closets and attics for prolonged periods of time, either for short periods of time, so for an hour, a day or so, so they weren't in the way or so they, quote, couldn't hurt themselves, or for most of their lives. Um, this was done to hide the shame of having a disabled family member. Uh, that kind of shame, uh, where being ashamed that someone in your family was born with a major physical impairment. That's not really something that is easy for us to understand in the modern day, but it is a type of morality and shame that people in the past did possess. Uh, and the so impacts of social isolation, of potential physical constraints, so being tied down or chained down or whatever, of the boredom, of the malnutrition, lack of sanitation, lack of potentially drinking water, and other harms of this kind of practice are almost incalculable. I, when I really start to think about this practice, that it wasn't universal. I'm sure there were many disabled people in, the, uh, and we're talking about the 1800s, so maybe the, the west or rural parts of all over the country. 
Um, I'm sure there are many disabled the people that were treated very well, but this was a socially acceptable thing to do, right? So, um, yeah, it's really frightening to think about, actually. <sighs> Conditions were actually a little better, though, in publicly funded insane asylums. Uh, one of the reasons why you would lock your disabled cousin in the closet is because you didn't want to put them in an insane asylum or because you weren't able to put them in an insane asylum because there wasn't one, one nearby. Um, in that era, they were asylums were considered to be uh, better uh, because they had some uh, quote-unquote medical oversight. Uh, crude treatments such as electroshock therapy and high pressure water therapies uh, were they were thought to be what was best for the person. Um, high pressure water therapies are a a, a, essentially uh, firing uh, fire hoses at uh, people with mental disabilities. Um, electroshock therapy uh, electrodes were this is a picture of electroshock therapy. This person on the right, um, the person's mouth was restrained, and their um, electrodes were attached to their head and other parts of their body and high, high, high voltage and ampage uh, currents were sent through the person's body. Uh, in most cases they were conscious for this as well, which, uh, so they were not anesthetized. So that added a level of um, pain and torture to that. Uh, it is important to keep in mind uh, that there is a, there are modern forms of electroshock therapy. Uh, because electroshock therapy is based on basic science, uh, it is shown to do something. So prior to, in the crude version of electroshock therapy, sometimes it would almost miraculously fix a person. In most cases it didn't. Uh, the modern version of it uh, has been shown to be effective in limited circumstances. The major horror of early versions of electroshock was that they would just do it to anyone just to see what would happen and uh, they would not take pain into consideration. They would not put the per make the person unconscious like they would do in the modern versions. Anyway, additionally, many patients were admitted uh, to asylums that by modern standards uh, would not be considered mentally unwell. Uh, hysterical and disobedient women. If you really want to go down our weird internet rabbit hole, look up uh, the medical condition of hysteria uh, as associated with women. Uh, it really is based in total um, pseudoscience and effectively makes the assumption that women are inherently inferior to men. Really unbelievably sexist stuff. Disobedient women. Basically women that did not listen to their uh, husbands were considered disobedient. Non-English speakers were sometimes put in insane asylums. Uh, it probably wasn't, in most cases, it probably wasn't because uh, the authorities thought that you were crazy for not speaking English. It was really just because uh, authorities didn't know what else to do with these people, which, is, which in a time of lacking communication technologies, not necessarily having telephones or any other means like that. It makes a certain sense, but it also makes no sense whatsoever, right? Uh, they certainly did do that, I guess is one way to put it. Uh, homosexuals. Uh, even prior to the very modern era, in the 1980s, there were some people still saying that uh, LGBT people had a certain kind of insanity um, in medical establishments. Uh, that is all done away with, but for a very long time, uh, homosexuals specifically in many parts of the LGBT community were considered to have uh, mental disorders. Uh, masturbators, uh, by modern standards, this is probably the most ridiculous one, um, but it, pleasuring oneself uh, sexually, uh, that was considered a mental defect, uh, which really goes a long way to show uh, how society has changed. But this also goes in realms of entertainment. Uh, so freak shows, uh, I'm assuming everyone's familiar with this concept. 
Freak shows were a popular form of entertainment in the 1800s in which typically uh, physically disabled people or physically different people were um, displayed and usually these were associated with circuses. Uh, these shows would feature people who would be considered either disabled or in some cases simply different or having some sort of minor medical condition. Um, these people were often psychologically and physically abused over the course of their careers. Uh, those with um, subnormal uh, mental capacities, so those people with learning disabilities, were often abused because they were effectively treated like animals would have been. Um, others, or all of them, were yelled insults at. It was um, considered uh, completely acceptable to throw things and yell insults at these uh, individuals in the freak show itself, so obviously that had a psychological impact on people. However, it must be said that um, this did serve a sense of community in some of the better run freak shows, right? Uh, people uh, who were very, very different banded together, they were able to form a community, and they were able to um, exist in that way, which there is in some isolated circumstances something to be said for that. Overall, though, I would not say I'm a proponent of freak shows, um, at least in this sense. Uh, freak shows would include uh, intersex people, so the, many of the bearded ladies uh, were probably uh, people who would today classify as being intersex, or many of them uh, may classified to be uh, trans in one way or another. Um, that the, we, we can't really know in most cases because uh, that would actually take a physical examination of the individual. Um, physically disabled people were often part of freak shows, so people with different shaped hands, uh, they called them lobster boys, they had uh, what appeared to be three fingers on each hand. Um, that is one, uh, one especially popular element. Uh, this man, uh, to our right, uh, who was very, very skinny, he's like the world, he was said to be the world's skinniest man. People would pay to see that. Pe people with microcephaly. Uh, so these, uh, two individuals with the grown man, um, I presume that those people are, those are children. Uh, they appear to be children. Uh, microcephaly. Uh, could also result in the individual being much shorter in stature, but I'm almost positive those are both children. Uh, you'll note the smaller heads and um, the uh, oblong shape of the head. Uh, they called those people pinheads. Um, again, hyper insensitive. Uh, you'll also note the swastikas on their sweaters. Uh, that obviously dates us as this is clearly prior to World War II. Remember that the swastika prior to World War II was uh, effectively a good luck symbol. Um, and it was sometimes tied also with Asia. So uh, who knows what they were trying to do uh, in that freak show. Maybe saying that these uh, people with microcephaly were from Asia. Who knows? Uh, they Because of the um, <laughs> complete lack of sensitivity uh, freak shows were basically free just to say whatever they wanted about people. Um, this uh, black people, African Americans and Africans uh, who suffer from uh, vitiligo, uh, the so-called leopard people. This is a condition that exists um, among uh, people of fairer complexions, but among uh, people of African descent especially. Uh, it is very um, prominent, it's very noticeable, and because of that, uh, freak shows decided that they could portray those people as being leopard people. Um, and actually even very old people. Uh, there is one notorious uh, freak show example where a woman was literally sold to a freak show uh, because this is the era immediately following slavery. Uh, she was, and she didn't obviously, nor how could she, understand her new condition as a freed person. Uh, she was sold to J.T. Barnum 
as the oldest woman in the world. Um, and that's a very interesting and terrifying story. Uh, she effectively just went along with it because she was too old to do anything about it otherwise. Uh, she wasn't incredibly old. They were billing her as being somewhere near 200 years old or something like that. She was probably in her late 70s, uh, a black woman. Um, just really horrible. They were selling grandmas. It's just, just unbelievable. Another uh, really ugly element regarding the disability in our society was the so-called science of eugenics. I really put science in quotes there because it was not a science. Uh, it was said to be the science of improving the race. Uh, obviously and most notoriously, this is linked with Nazi Germany. It was uh, said to, the purpose of it was to separate the well-born with from the not well born obviously those are also social constructions uh, but uh, eugenics was also practiced in the United States eugenics also drove US government policy drove the way we treated Native Americans drove the way we uh, ran organizations that would become the CDC they don't do things like that anymore but there were forced steriliza ster sterilizations, for example, that occurred in the 1900s because of the eugenics movement. Uh, nearly all aspects of eugenics have been discredited. Uh, for example, um, head size is not linked with intelligence. That was a major uh, component of eugenics. You'll see that small girl to our right, uh, her head was being measured. Measuring heads was a big component of eugenics. Uh, the size and shape of your nose, the size and shape of other physical characteristics of your body. These were uh, major components and obsessions of the so-called eugenic sciences. Um, and uh, race was a major component of eugenics. It was about bet not just bettering humanity, but bettering specific races, particularly uh, people of European descent because, you know, that's the race that was doing it the most. Um, with all that said, eugenics was a terrible thing, but there were some findings found, just like with electroshock therapy, that did lay the ground, groundwork for modern science. So modern genetics, by tracing human lineages, we were able to determine and a few diseases, right, by this really ugly not good science and then it was fixed in the 40s 50s and 60s to become what genetics can be can be today um, genetics is a very worthwhile discipline but it is important to remember where our um, scientific advances came from let's talk about a bit of positive progress uh, by the 1970s asylums and other mental hospitals uh, were being closed uh, for humanitarian concerns this had both good and bad effects. Uh, the good effect is that major abuses in asylums stopped once they were closed, and that is a good thing. So the mass use of electroshock therapy or of hydrotherapy stopped, and that's good. But the bad uses are that it dismantled uh, what could have become a viable mental health system. So instead of reforming the mental hospital system, what they did was effectively do away with it. And for this reason, there are very few mental hospitals in our society today. Thus, it made mental health access far less accessible, especially for poor people. Um, you almost never hear of uh, people with severe mental health issues being admitted to um, mental hospitals uh, for prolonged periods of time. And there are many people that could benefit from that. Uh, additionally, this is a major contributing factor to homelessness because many homeless people do suffer from mental health problems and uh, some of those people simply are not capable of taking care of themselves in a traditional sense. They would have uh, been able to be cared for in a mental hospital, again, a humane mental hospital. Uh, but also, there are some people that could have, could be fixed, right, if they were given the proper treatment, but they aren't being fixed today, so they continue to be homeless. It's a very sad condition. In 1973, uh, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 came into effect. This was also part of the 
um, closing of mental hospitals, but it legally set aside disabled people as being a so-called protected class. We're not talking about socioeconomic class, we're talking about group of people. So this confirmed that disabled people deserved, uh, sorry there's a typo there, uh, deserve special attention. So that legally you have to treat disabled people in certain ways, that they deserve certain things, uh, that, and this established effectively that ableist discrimination uh, was a real thing, that uh, sometimes disabled people are being abused. And that's not something that we even acknowledged as a society prior to 1973. And then that was an important factor in laying for the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, as I touched on earlier in this lecture. In 1990, the ADA uh, laid out that workplaces, schools, and public institutions must be accessible for people with disabilities. Uh, this sounds like a very basic thing. Uh, it's kind of mind-blowing that this open only happened in 1990, but this was when it happened. It happened in 1990, in many of our lifetimes stated that institutions must make, quote, reasonable accommodations for employees and students. And it laid out in great detail what those reasonable accommodations would be. Uh, this is where, uh, if you have any interaction with uh, disability services on uh, a college level or even in many workplaces, this is where the concept of disability services comes from. Um, it also laid out that architecture must be uh, taken into mind for disabled people. So there must be ramps, there must be braille signage, there must be buttons to open doors that are difficult to open. Uh, prior to the ADA, ableism was overwhelmingly part of the hiring process. Uh, it was entirely legal to just say, no, you can't do this job, you're in a wheelchair. Well, it's a, and you're, you could respond back to that, well, this doesn't require walking, this is just a secretary job. Uh, I just sit at the desk and they could just say tough, tough, right? Um, now that is an illegal thing to do. Um, the ADA does not ask for unqualified people to be employed. It simply asks the employer to make reasonable accommodations so that someone can do a job. I was once on vacation where I you know, it's hard to be on vacation as a sociologist because you can't really turn off your sociology brain. And I saw a man working at a uh, food checkout place and he was in a wheelchair and he was, his head was effectively at the same level as the counter, right? He, so he was far below where he would have probably liked to be sitting, but he was sitting in a wheelchair. And it was obvious to me he was not being granted his uh, accommodations, right? He, um, he should have had a chair, a taller chair that he could have sat in, sat in and gotten into so that he could sit in a similar spot as the other people that were being cash register, working the cash register, as opposed to reaching so far and being at that really weird level. Uh, that would have been a reasonable accommodation that his employer should have granted him. Um, I, I still regret not making a big deal out of that. He didn't seem to be overly miserable over it. Um, I kind of made a morality call in the moment uh, where maybe it's not my place to butt in. I'm not sure. I probably should have. Um, I sometimes think about that still. Anyway, why is all this important? Because the ADA is more than about just a job, it's about the value of the individual and the visibility of disabled people. If we never see people with disabilities, we're more likely to stare at them, right? Because this, this is a novel thing that we've never seen before. Um, that's part of the staring phenomena that goes with disabled people. It's incredibly impolite, but it is also something that humans do. Um, if they, if disabled people are part of a community, if they work, if they interact with us, we won't do that. We won't do that as much. Additionally, uh, having a job is very important for uh, social, the social structure. It's very important in terms of us uh, making ourselves feel good about what we do every day. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in the second uh, part of the lectures for uh, this unit. 
In 2008, the ADA was updated. Uh, it was um, slightly imperfect the way it was passed in the 1990s. It wasn't super clear as to what substantially limits life activities was. Uh, it was expanded to include life activities to include reading, learning, the ability to concentrate, the ability to think, the ability to communicate, and the ability to work as major life activities. So what that effectively did was that the early ADA was really geared toward physical disabilities and then the update of the ADA was all about making mental disabilities a greater part of that. So things like ADHD and other learning disabilities became uh, plugged into the kinds of things that we could grant accommodations for. Uh, we especially see this on college campuses with granting double time for tests and stuff like that because we acknowledge that that is something that some people need. Um, and this, uh, yeah, and that's effectively uh, probably uh, the way um, many of you may have vaguely encountered it, even in a tangential sort of way. Okay, that is the end of this lecture. Um, as with everything, please let me know if you have any questions.